Right, let us give you some help answering questions to do with radioactivity. Question 1. Which one of these statements about alpha radiation is correct? So alpha looks like that. Mass of 4, charge of 2. It's made of two protons and two neutrons. Alpha radiation has no charge. That's incorrect because it's got a charge of plus two. Alpha radiation is very ionizing. That's correct. Alpha radiation travels very far in air. No, it only travels a couple of centimeters. Alpha radiation is an electromagnetic wave. No. So the answer was definitely B. Part B. When an atom emits an alpha particle, its nucleus changes, which describes the changes in the nucleus. Put a cross in the box next to your answer. So remember the nucleus is in the middle. You've got your shells on the outside where the electrons are in. All gamma radiation comes from the middle from the nucleus and if you're going to lose an alpha particle it means you've gave off two protons and two neutrons so the proton number will decrease by two and the mass number will decrease by four so the answer is A. Question two the diagram shows an atom of carbon a, B and C are three different particles. Name the three different particles shown. Well, carbon is carbon-12 usually, unless it's an isotope, and it's got six on the bottom. So that means it's got six protons, and this number here is the protons added to the neutrons. So if it's got six protons, it must also, in this case, have six neutrons. Now, if we count, remember the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus in the middle. So let's just count and see how many we've got. The white ones first. One, two, three, four, five. I've got six of them. Uh, so to be honest, they could be the protons or the neutrons. Uh, the darker ones, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six of them as well. Yep. Yeah. And C, well, they're the electrons in the in the outside. So we'll put them in first because they're definitely the electrons. And A could be protons. You could put O neutrons. In which case B would be neutrons. Or protons. Now if I was you I would just put that, that and that. So I wouldn't bother putting them, even though you could actually put neutrons and then protons. But I wouldn't put that and that, and then that and that. Part 2. What is the mass or nucleon number of this carbon atom? Well, if you didn't know, all you had to do was count how many particles are in the nucleus. And we've already counted them as 12. Question 3. The diagram shows the structure of an atom. Complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. The size of the charge on each electron is... A third of the charge on a proton? No. Charge on a proton is plus 1. Charge on an electron is minus 1. So half the charge of the proton? No. The same as the charge on the proton. So we're looking for the size. So that is correct. Because that size is 1 and that size is 1. So you didn't have to worry about whether it was positive or negative for this particular question. If it said, what is the sign of the charge? Then obviously one's positive and one's negative. Part 2. 
Complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. The atomic number of a neutral atom is always the same as the number of, well, it'll be electrons. So if it's neutral, that means however many protons it's got will equal the number of electrons. So that's how many pluses it's got. It'll have the same number of minuses. So let's just say it had 12 pluses. That means it'll have 12 minuses. And that means overall it's zero, which is neutral. Now these questions have been taken from a number of different papers. So you might see the same sort of questions coming up again and again as I go over this paper. Now that's a really positive sign because it means if you practice this paper, there's a good chance that some of these questions will come up again this year because examiners just use the same questions year after year. They just change them slightly. Part B. The element radium has a radioactive isotope radium-226 and it can be written as 226 on the top, 88 on the bottom and then Ra. The radioactive isotope emits alpha particles. The alpha particle has a mass number of 4. So remember, mass number goes on the top and it contains two protons. So that's the proton number on the bottom or the atomic number on the bottom. And that's your sign for alpha. It's like a fish swimming to the left. Using the numbers in the box, complete the following sentences. When an alpha particle is emitted, the mass number becomes, right, well, we've already talked about this. So if that's your nucleus in the middle, and a little alpha particle comes out, what it's basically doing is it's kicking out two protons. I'll make them the black ones, and then two neutrons, which would be the white ones. So the mass number is going to become four less than it was. So the mass number was 226. Let's take four away from that, and it's going to go down to 222. Part two. When an alpha particle is emitted, the atomic number becomes, right, well, we've lost two protons. So let's take two away from that, and that's going to go down to 86. Part C. Describe how the emissions from radioactive substances can be dangerous to living things. Now, it's worth two marks. So what I say to my students is, say, it damages cells and it causes cancer. Don't just say it causes cancer. Examiners like you to say both parts. Even if the question was only worth one mark, I would still say the same thing. There are other things you could say, like it affects the DNA, causes mutations, ionizations, burns, sickness. But honestly, just remember that damages cells and causes cancer. Part D. Explain one precaution that is taken in hospitals to limit the risks of exposure to radiation. Right, well, I would say stay away from it. If you do have to handle it, spend a limited amount of time there and shield yourself using some kind of lead shield. And if you do need to pick it up, pick it up using tongs. So it was only worth two marks. I've put three things there for you. Question four. The mass of a proton is that. The mass of an electron is that. Calculate how many times the mass of a proton is greater than the mass of an electron. Give your answer to two significant figures. Right, so what we're looking for is the mass of the proton divided by the mass of the electron. In other words, how many times does this little thing fit into that big thing? That's times 10 to the minus 27, which means it's small. But that is times 10 to the minus 31, which means it's even smaller. So how many times does the little electron fit into the proton? Right, let's put the numbers in. Right. 
and that comes out as 1836.125 Right, now it's worth three marks and they want you to do it to two significant figures. So the first figure that is not a zero is this one and then what we need is just the second significant figure to go with it. If we look at the third figure, it's a three, so that's going to round down. So that is going to be 1,800. So make sure you know what a significant figure means compared to decimal places. Because some students can mix them up. Question five. Iodine-131 is a radioactive isotope with a half-life of eight days. Now that means every eight days the activity will half. Okay, so what is the activity? The activity of a sample of Iodine-131 is 480 becquerels. Calculate the activity of the sample after 16 days. Right, well I tell my students to always set it out the same. So do the initial activity, that's 480 becquerels. Right, so 8 days later it's going to half. So it's going to go down to 240 becquerels. And then we need to know what's happening after 16 days. So another 8 days. It's going to half again. And that's your 16 days. So it's going to have gone down from 240 to 120. And that's becquerels. So that's how I encourage my students to do it, by setting it out like that. Question 6. Carbon-13 and carbon-14 are isotopes of carbon. Now what that means, and this is often a two-mark question, is it's got the same number of protons or same atomic number, because that is the number of protons. And it's got a different number of neutrons. So that's often a question for two marks. Right, complete the table for an atom of carbon-13 and an atom of carbon-14. So carbon-13, number of neutrons in the nucleus. Right, well the bottom number here is the number of protons and the top number here is the number of protons added to the number of neutrons. So if we take the number of protons, this bottom number, away from the top number that'll leave us just with the number of neutrons. So for carbon-13 if we did 13 take away 6, that's going to give us 7. And for carbon-14, this one over here, so we'll take the mass number and we'll take away the atomic number, just like before. And that'll give us 8. Number of electrons in orbit around the nucleus. Well, remember, the number of electrons is just the same as the number of protons. So for carbon-13, the number of protons was 6. And for carbon-14, the number of protons was also 6. Question 7. Everyone is exposed to background radiation. Some of this radiation comes from natural sources. There are many radioactive isotopes in nuclear waste. Technetium-99 is just one of these isotopes. People are worried about how we should deal with nuclear waste. Explain why it is difficult to deal with nuclear waste safely. 
And this question is a six marker. Right, first things first, let's just say that radioactivity is dangerous. That's why people are worried. Now, why is it dangerous? It can cause cancer. Now, how long does it stay dangerous for? Well, it can have a very long half-life, so it stays dangerous for a long time. Now, you've usually got to bury it in the ground and you've got to keep it inside a lead-lined container. And what happens if it leaks? So it's difficult to transport. It needs burying. Kept in a lead-lined container. And people are worried that it might leak. And contaminate the local area. So there's quite a lot of points there that I've put. You decide which ones are the easiest for you to remember. Question 8. Carbon-14 is radioactive and has a half-life of 5,700 years. The number of radioactive carbon-14 atoms in a very old piece of wood is found to have decreased from 1 million to 125,000. Determine the age of a piece of wood. Now, there's two definitions of half-life. One is the amount of time that it takes for the activity to half, and the other definition is the amount of time it takes for the number of radioactive atoms present to half. So if we start with a million atoms, that must have halved to half a million. Then it must have halved again down to 250,000. And then it must have halved again down to the 125,000. That's what it said. How long is it going to take to go from a million down to 125,000? Well, we had to half it three times. And we know that each half life, which is the amount of time that it takes to half, is 5,700 years. Three times by half lives. So that means 3 times by 5,700 years. And that'll give us our answer. And that's 17,100. That's how old the wood must be. So you'll notice I set that out very similar to how I set the last one out. I just find it nice and easy because it's visual. You can see what's going on. Question 9. X-rays can be used in diagnosis and treatment from outside the body. Some X-rays are absorbed by bone as they travel through the body. Figure 4 shows how the intensity of the X-ray beam gets less as the X-rays travel further through the bone. So that's the thickness into the bone. And you can see the intensity of the X-ray beam is decreasing. And the question says, use the graph to determine the thickness of bone that will reduce the percentage intensity of the X-ray beam by half. Okie dokie. So at first, we've got 100% and we just need to know how long, or what was the thickness rather, where we've only got 50% left. So you go along, 
to the 50 percent till you hit the line and then you come down to here and what's that that looks like 6.6 .6 to me so the thickness to go from 100% down to 50% so for it a half it took 6.7 centimeters of thickness of the bone 6.6 .6. Part 2. Radioactive isotopes may be placed inside the body for treatment. The energy absorbed by tissue in the body needs to be known. The number of joules of energy absorbed by each kilogram of tissue is measured in one of the units shown. The unit is... oh well. Number of joules of energy absorbed by each kilogram of tissue. So that's going to be joules per kilogram and that's just B so that's pretty straightforward as long as you read the question correctly and don't panic it sounded like it was going to be a bit complicated when we read the first bit but it wasn't question 10 medical physicists have developed endoscopes and many other devices to help doctors diagnose medical problems Compare the use of electromagnetic radiation in endoscopes and in one other diagnostic device. Barnacles, that's quite tricky. Depends how much your teacher's taught you. Because this is one of these questions where it's difficult for the teacher to know just how deeply to go. Right, so it's about endoscopes and it's about the electromagnetic radiation. So first things first, do you know what an endoscope is? What it basically is, just say you've got something wrong with your stomach. They'll put a fibre down into your tummy, through your mouth. And they'll put light down through the cable so they can see what's going on down there. And then the light sort of bounces back up, goes to a camera where the medical person can see what's going on. And we've got to compare the use of electromagnetic radiation in endoscopes in one other diagnostic device. Right, so we've got to compare an endoscope against something else that also uses electromagnetic radiation. Right. So first of all, let's get the seven different electromagnetic waves. Raging Martians invade Venus using X-ray guns. Radio, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Now over here, the wavelength is long. As you move over towards the gamma, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So your wavelength is short. Your frequency is high, which is how many times per second the wave vibrates. So you can see there, look at that going up and down. That's a lot. And whatever the frequency is doing, that's also what the energy is doing. So that's high energy here. And over here, the wavelength was long. The frequency was low. And the energy was low. Right, well, your teacher should have told you that you can use x-rays for looking at broken bones. So if we compare an endoscope uses visible light and we'll compare the electromagnetic radiation of visible light compared to, say, X-rays. Right. Endoscope uses visible light. So that's low frequency, low energy, 
and save to use. Whereas X rays are used for taking X rays of bones. Not sure if we'll get a mark for that, but that's our other diagnostic device, X rays. Right, their frequency is high instead of low. They've got a high energy and they're dangerous. They can damage cells and they could cause cancer. And I could write in about their wavelength just to make sure that I get all my marks. So remember, the visible light had a long wavelength and the X-rays had a short wavelength. Now everything that I've said about the X-rays, you could say similar things about gamma rays as well. So just in case next time they say you're not allowed to say X-rays. But I, I hope you understand what I've sort of done there. Question 11. Describe how the emissions from radioactive substances can be dangerous to living things. Two marks. Well, we've already had a question like this. Remember, all these questions have been taken from two or three different papers. So you can see it's the same questions coming up again. They damage cells. And it can cause cancer. If you did want to put a little bit more information in case it was worth three, why do they damage cells? It's because they ionise the cells. Radioactive substances can be ionising. Question 12. Figure 17 shows a Geiger Muller tube used for measuring radioactivity. A radioactive rock is placed near to the front of a Geiger Muller tube. A radioactivity count rate is first made in air. The count rate is measured again with each of the three different absorbers between the rock and the GM tube. Figure 19 shows the count rates measured. Right, so when it's just A, you get 1,272 count rates. Pop a thin sheet of the paper in the way, and it goes down to 931. Then put some a thick sheet of aluminium, and it goes down again and then put some thick sheet of lead and it goes down again. A scientist has an idea that the rock emits three different types of radiation. Explain how the data in this table supports the scientist's idea. Right, let me make sure you know what's going on here. So if this is the GM tube, Geiger Muller tube, and then that goes off to a counter. So by the way, for one mark, sometimes they say, what can you use in order to measure radiation? And you can just say Geiger Muller tube. Now, at first, to put the radioactive rock three centimetres, so this is given off the sort of radiation, if you like. That should say three centimetres. You've got 1,272 little bits of radiation are going into the GM tube per second. Now that could be alpha, it could be beta, and it could be gamma. Now what they do is they put a thin sheet of paper in the way. Now if you put a thin sheet of paper in the way, alpha gets blocked by paper. or absorbed by paper. And the count rate dropped from 1,272 down to 931. So that proves that alpha must be there. Right. 
alpha must be emitted by the rock. Now what they've done next is they've took the paper out the way and they've put a thin sheet of aluminium there instead. Now aluminium is used to block beta. So the fact that it's gone down again, or that it's gone down from the original, must mean that there was some beta in the way that couldn't get through the aluminium. And then finally, they took the aluminium out the way and they've put a thick sheet of lead there. Now, the count rate dropped once again, so that must mean that gamma was there. Now, if you're wondering why is it still on 21 and not on zero, well, that must be the background count rate. And remember, background radiation is around us all the time. There's nothing you can do to stop it. So the 21 must be the count rate of the background radiation in this case. So I'll easily get me six marks for that. I'll just see here that the count rate dropped when lead placed in weir. Question 13. In 1908, a scientist called Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, was investigating ideas about atoms. His students fired a beam of alpha particles at a thin piece of gold foil. Figure 10 shows the arrangement of the experiment. Some alpha particles were found at all parts of the ring of detectors. The table in figure 11 shows how many alpha particles were detected at P, at Q and at R in one experiment. Explain what the information in figure 10 and figure 11 shows about the structure of an atom. And that's for six marks. Right, this is just our standard gold leaf foil experiment. Now hopefully your teacher's told you that alpha particles, mass of four and a charge of two. They've got an overall charge of two plus. Now the way you might have saw this, this gold foil here is made of little atoms like that. I'll draw it bigger over here. Right, so that gold foil there is this gold foil here. And what they're going to do is they're going to shoot an alpha, or lots of alphas, and we know that alpha is positive. Now, we also know that the nucleus is positive. This is the actual experiment where Rutherford discovered the nucleus. Now, you can see that most of the alpha particles that were fired actually ended up at position P. So most of them went straight through. Most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold and went to P. Uh, only 25 of them shot off upwards and went to Q. Now you ask yourself the question, how can it fire upwards? Well, if the alpha particle got close enough to the nucleus, it would end up getting deflected upwards to somewhere like position Q. And at position R, hardly any of the alpha particles came back and hit over here. So that must mean for that to happen, you're going to have to have 
a head-on collision with the nucleus. So the nucleus must be so small that that doesn't really happen very often. Now if we put all that together, this is how you write it. Most alpha particles were discovered at position P. I've quoted the value. This means they went straight through. So most of the atom must be empty space. So 25 alpha particles were found at Q. This means they were deflected. Alpha is positive, so the nucleus, which is the central part of the atom, must also be positive. And finally, position R. So not many alpha particles were found at position R. This means that the nucleus must be very small compared to the size of the atom because we didn't have many head-on collisions, which is what was required for a particle to end up at position R. I've got a nice little video all to do with that, and it's to do with the history of the atom on my YouTube channel if you want to check it out. Question 14. Some isotopes are unstable. They emit beta minus particles when they decay. Explain how a nucleus changes when a beta minus particle is emitted. So these questions can be quite tricky. So a beta minus particle has, it's basically an electron. So it's got zero mass and it's got a charge of minus one. Now the way I like to do these, is say let's balance that charge out so if that's minus one i like to put a plus one there now what particle from a proton a neutron and an electron do you know that's got a plus one charge well the proton has got a plus one charge and it's got a massive one the neutron has got a charge of zero and it's got a massive one, and your electron has got a charge of minus one and a massive zero. So hopefully you know these three things. A lot of this is just chemistry. So if this here has got a charge of plus one, it must be a proton, and therefore it'll have a massive one. Now, where did that come from? Something in the nucleus must have changed in order to spit these two things out. Now, we just need to balance the charge. So the charge number's on the bottom. So what do you get if you add minus one to plus one? You end up getting zero. And what do you get if you add zero to one? you get one. Right. So of these three subatomic particles, what do you know that's got a charge of zero and a mass of one? Well, it's a neutron. So a neutron in the nucleus must have split up into a proton and it emitted the beta particle. So remember, that's the mass number on the top, and that's the charge number on the bottom. And when you're doing these equations, um, mass 
needs to be balanced before and after. And the charge needs to be balanced before and after. So a beta minus particle is just a fast moving electron. Question 15. The typical size of an atom is... Right, well, that's kind of one of the things you either know or you don't. So hopefully your teacher told you it was 10 times 10 to the minus 10. 0 0.1 nanometers. Okay. If they do ask you for the typical size of a nucleus, the nucleus is about 10,000 times smaller. So if we had to choose one for the nucleus, it would be 10 to the minus 15. Question 16. Other unstable isotopes emit alpha particles. Which of these describes an alpha particle? So remember an alpha particle, it's got a mass of four, charge of plus two. It's basically two protons, if we say the protons are the black ones, and two neutrons, which would be the white ones. And they, remember, are inside the nucleus. Uh, now, they don't actually have any electrons around the outside. So what this basically is, is it's the helium nucleus. Okay, so that would be helium. 4,2 is helium. Except an alpha has got no electrons. So it's just the helium nucleus. The middle bit. Question 17. A student uses 59 dice to model radioactive decay. He starts by rolling all the dice at the same time. He removes all the dice that show a 6. He then rolls the remaining dice. The student repeats this process five more times. State two improvements the student could make to his model of radioactive decay. Well, Use more dice and roll it more than four times. More repeats. Question 18. Choose words from the box to complete the following sentences. Words may be used once, more than once, or not at all. Make sure you read that. The radiation that is a wave is, is it alpha, beta, gamma, or positron? Well, it's gamma. That was one of the electromagnetic waves. The particle that is negatively charged is, well, as we've said, Alpha has got a charge of plus two. Beta is basically a fast moving electron and a positron. Well, even if your teacher hasn't told you much about that, it's got the word sort of positron, which sounds like positive. So that's positive. It's actually an anti beta. It's like the opposite of a beta. So it's still got zero mass, but it's got a charge of plus one. So the particle that is negatively charged is beta. Question 19. Many different types of radiation are used by doctors. Which type of radiation comes from radioactive sources? Put a cross in the box. Is gamma radioactive? Yeah. That's pretty much it then. Let's just check the others. Ultrasound? Nope. Is ultraviolet radioactive? Nah. What about x-rays? Nah. And finally, question 20. So if you're still here, well done. This will have an increase on your success in your exams. Definitely. 
Explain how radiation from radioactive sources can be dangerous to people. This is the third time we've saw the same question, so hopefully your confidence has gone through the roof. Damages cells and causes cancer. And just in case you can put, it's ionising. Radiation is ionising. And there we go. Remember, the more you practice, the better you get. So work hard, be nice, good luck in your exams, and I'll see you in the next video.